Good evening. Tonight in True Stories, we look at the mystery surrounding the death of Hitler and secrets that have only now been revealed in what really happened to Adolf Hitler. In the guarded storeroom of this Moscow archive, a crudely wrapped bundle of tattered paper is claimed by Russian authorities to contain part of the skull of Adolf Hitler. It was the personal souvenir of Joseph Stalin, brought from Berlin by his agents as a vengeful trophy of war. Only now, with the disintegration of the Soviet Union and the end of the Cold War, is once closely guarded information gradually coming to light. Today, after nearly 50 years, former Soviet intelligence officers have broken lifetime vows of silence to tell the true story of Adolf Hitler's end. Maps drawn from memory agree on the site of a secret German grave, and detection equipment finds underground evidence which supports the recollections. Here lie the bodies of Hitler and Eva Braun. As the conquerors of Berlin, the Soviets alone had first-hand knowledge of Adolf Hitler's fate. But for decades, the truth has been clouded in deception and misinformation. New evidence from once secret KGB files and former Soviet intelligence agents has now revised the concluding chapter of World War II history. I have never told anyone about this until now. It is the first time. This is the astounding story of what really happened to Adolf Hitler. Adolf Hitler, Führer and Reich Chancellor of Nazi Germany, and on his way to becoming the most hated man of the 20th century. With his words, he captivated a nation, and with his power, he cast the world into war. Hitler's grotesque Third Reich would come to be synonymous with savagery, destruction, and murder. When the war was finally over, when the Nazi dream of world domination was dead, one haunting question remained. Where was Adolf Hitler? The architect of World War II had seemingly disappeared. Had he escaped to South America? Was he hiding in Berlin? Or had he committed suicide? Amid the rumors and speculation, the Soviets alone knew what happened. But for nearly half a century, the truth was deliberately hidden. Until now. The Dutch journalist Klaus Hendricks, in collaboration with his British colleague Charles Barrent, have spent three years uncovering the extraordinary story. A story that was meant to stay secret. Most of the Russians finally want to come clean with their own war. They never had known the truth about their own war. And like many Europeans, at this point in history, they really want to know what happened in what was once their war. Where Red Square touches the Kremlin Wall lies a place of ultimate honor. Entombed here are Soviet heroes and leaders, including Joseph Stalin. Until his death, Stalin had maintained a secret and jealously guarded collection of Hitler's personal belongings. On his deathbed, Stalin ordered that they be locked away forever in the vaults of Moscow's military museum. Before the failed coup of 1991, Hardly anyone knew they existed. But recently, special permission was granted to film the Hitler plunder. Joseph Stalin was obsessed with Hitler, and no one outside his most privileged and trusted circle was allowed to know of the Hitler mementos, which had been spirited out of Berlin to form the trophy collection. There was a book of Hitler watercolors taken from the Fuhrer's bunker, they were painted by Hitler in his youth and reminded him, perhaps, of less trying and turbulent days. Landscapes were his favorite subjects, for Hitler lacked an ability to render human forms, except as insignificant passers-by. Also in Stalin's possession, Hitler's own VIP guest book. The last entries record those with him in the bunker, 
in the final days before Soviet soldiers conquered all of Berlin. There was also a pair of Hitler's boots, somehow preserved in excellent condition. There was his walking stick, carved from oak with a reindeer antler handle and covered with Nazi symbols. Most curious of all was the Führer's violin, complete with a miniature effigy of Adolf Hitler's head. Also from the bunker, Hitler's dinner jacket. It was partially scorched by fire, possibly from a grenade blast during the Soviet assault on his Berlin headquarters. In 1945, Berlin was a target marked for destruction, the last desperate stronghold of Adolf Hitler's Third Reich. The tide of World War II had turned, and the power of Nazi Germany was being brought to an end. Day and night, Allied bombers pummeled Hitler's seat of power turning Berlin to fire and rubble in the face of determined resistance. By agreement with the Western Allies, it was left to the Soviet armies to capture all of the city, perhaps the greatest and most costly prize of the war. As the Nazi capital bled from its wounds, two and a half million Soviet soldiers advanced steadily from the east. skirts of Berlin, the Soviets announced their arrival with a vengeance. April 20th, 1945. Hitler's 56th birthday. As Russian artillery echoed overhead, he conducted an informal inspection of a troop of Hitler youth. Their lives would be ruthlessly sacrificed in his vain defense of Berlin. This was the last film footage ever taken of Adolf Hitler. With the Soviet onslaught pounding ever closer, Hitler retreated to the safety of his bunker below the Chancellery. With him was his mistress, Eva Braun, and his loyal minister of propaganda, Joseph Goebbels. Goebbels' wife, Magda, and their six young children also took refuge there. By now, the Soviet armies had encircled all of Berlin. During the next 12 days, they slowly tightened their grip, moving steadily closer to the center of the city, where Hitler's chancellery lay. The battle for Berlin was a nightmare in hell, the most ferocious encounter of the war. Hitler had ordered his generals to a suicidal defense, forcing the Soviet army to take Berlin block by block, building by building, soldier by soldier. The cost in lives to Red Army forces would exceed one half million men. Finally, on May 2nd, 1945, Soviet soldiers took the last few acres of Adolf Hitler's empire. They stormed the Nazi Reichstag and Chancellery to raise their red banner of victory. For those who survived, a long-awaited celebration in the spring sunshine of Berlin. Yet while victorious soldiers danced, triumphant generals brooded. The Third Reich had been crushed, but until Adolf Hitler was found, the war was not truly over. Berlin was now controlled by the Soviets alone, 
and the story of their search for Hitler has, until very recently, been a closely guarded secret. This is the first time in their life that they feel free to speak out. They never could do so, because out of fear, all those guys had pledged a solemn oath never to reveal what happened in 45. And now, with the Soviet empire crumbling and the KGB disappearing into the wings of their political society, now they feel free to come clean for the very first time, and they speak. General Mikhail Milstein was deputy head of military intelligence in the Soviet army's Berlin operation. Of course, at the very final stage of the war, one of our missions was to find the bunker where Hitler and his closest associates were hiding. I mean Ava Brown, Goebbels, and some others who were still with him and stayed to the end. At that moment, capturing Hitler alive would be a victory. I mean not only a military victory, but a personal victory for Stalin. Victory over a man who had betrayed him. Hitler and Stalin had not always been enemies. But in 1941, 18 months after signing a non-aggression treaty with the Soviet leader, Hitler launched a treacherous and brutal surprise invasion of the Soviet Union. Stalin, I have always been certain, thought of Hitler as his ally. I'm sorry if you don't like what I'm saying. Stalin was certain he could accomplish great tasks with Hitler's support with his ideas, his power, his army, his potential. Then he hoped the two of them would rule the world together. Stalin's failed ambitions turned into an obsession for personal revenge on Adolf Hitler. He assigned the job of finding the Fuhrer to an elite and ruthless corps of intelligence agents that reported directly to him. They were known as Smirsch. The name meant death to spies and its members formed the cruel black heart of the vast security apparatus built up by Stalin. In the immediate aftermath of the conquest of Berlin, Smirsch officers led a frantic search of the Nazi Reich Chancellery, Hitler's headquarters and seat of power. They found little more than rubble and debris, shattered remnants of a murderous regime that had sought by savage violence to rule the entire world. In the Chancellery Garden, an entrance to a bunker was found. The Soviets had not known it existed, and inside, Smirsch discovered Adolf Hitler's last refuge. They found his bed and his sitting room, but no trace of Hitler himself. Major Vasily Orlovsky was senior operations officer with Smirsch in Berlin. On May 2nd, Members of the Smirsch section of the 79th Infantry Corps discovered two bodies at the entrance to the Chancellery bunker. They were the badly burned bodies of Goebbels and his wife, Magda. Goebbels and his wife had committed suicide. Their bodies doused with gasoline and burned. Before taking their own lives, they poisoned their six young children with cyanide. Smirsch learned these facts from Vice Admiral Eric Voss, a captured Nazi officer who identified the of Goebbels. Colonel Ivan Blachuk was in charge of security for Officer Smirsch. My assignment was to organize the identification of those bodies. I was responsible for it. When Vice Admiral Voss saw the Goebbels family, he became very depressed because he thought of him as a close friend. When he returned to his prison cell, he cut his veins with scissors. Then he panicked and started shouting that he was going to die. So I called the doctor to bandage his hand and stop the bleeding. 
When I asked him why he had done it, he answered that if a great man like Goebbels could pay with his own life and the lives of his family, then he didn't deserve to go on living himself. Many of Hitler's henchmen chose suicide rather than capture by the Red Army or the dreaded members of Smirsch. Among them was Colonel General Hans Krebs, Hitler's last chief of staff. Krebs had been part of Hitler's loyal bunker entourage. But still, there was no sign of Adolf Hitler himself. From numerous Nazi officers, now Soviet prisoners of war, Smirsch began to learn details of what had taken place in the bunker during the final days of the war. Interrogation revealed that Hitler was feeble and ill, his hands constantly shaking from uncontrollable tremors. To test the efficacy of his cyanide capsules, he had poisoned his favorite dog, as well as the dog belonging to Eva Braun. Several hours later, in an improvised bunker ceremony, Hitler and Braun were married. For Soviet Field Marshal Georgi Zhukov, such facts were of little interest. Joseph Stalin had ordered him to capture Hitler alive. Major General Vladimir Antonov commanded the Red Army unit which captured Hitler's chancellery. When Zhukov arrived in the chancellery, the first thing he asked me was, where is Hitler? I said, Comrade Marshal, Goebbels is over there. General Rottenhaber and an SS brigade commander have been taken prisoner. As for Hitler, I don't know anything yet. Zhukov said, you must find him, Colonel, by all means. So far, Hitler had eluded the Soviet searchers. But two days after taking the chancellery, a body was discovered, hidden not far from the bunker. Red Army cameraman Mikhail Pozelsky photographed the corpse. We were assigned to go to the chancellery and film a, a dead Hitler. And so when we went there, we knew that they had found Hitler's body. Of course, we had never seen Hitler in person up to this point, but from photographs and film footage of him that were brought to us, uh, we thought the body had a definite resemblance to Hitler. Even those Germans that were asked to give an identification were not so certain. Some said it was Hitler, others that it wasn't. Even the experts hesitated. And then the general took a sheet of paper and he drew a vertical line down the middle. They started all over again and invited the Germans from the chancellery who knew Hitler to approach the corpse one by one. And then the Germans had to see if it was them responsible. Most signed that it was not. But some said that it was very difficult to establish if it was Hitler or not. And then the pathologist came. He asked to see a photograph or a visual representation of Hitler in profile. He wanted to see the details of an ear. He uh, studied the ear on the photograph, and then he compared it to the body's ear. It seems that a human ear is as unique as fingerprints. From the ear examination, he concluded that it wasn't Hitler's body. He explained his opinion to the military experts, and they came to the conclusion that it most likely was not Hitler, but his double. Soviet intelligence was aware of the fact that Hitler doubles existed. When I say doubles, we should keep in mind that the number of such people was very limited. I can't give you the exact number, but there were very few of them. The reason is, of course, that it was a secret. Very few people knew it. You understand that those doubles were, in fact, lookalikes who were present at parades or moved ahead of him. We had grounds to believe there were doubles because sometimes he appeared to be in two different places at the same time. 
Smirsch suspected the look-alike had been deliberately planted in a desperate attempt to fool them, to throw them off the track. If so, the Soviets weren't fooled for long, and the determined hunt for Hitler continued through the Chancellery complex. Early on the morning of May 5th, after three days of careful searching, members of the Smirsch unit focused their attention on a large artillery crater, not far from the bunker exit. When the base of the crater was excavated, the severely charred bodies of a man, a woman, and two dogs were found. Smirsch suspected they had finally discovered Hitler and Eva Braun. The human remains were placed into empty ammunition boxes. This is the box that was thought to hold Adolf Hitler. An eyewitness account of events in the Chancellery Garden provided supporting evidence. The Smirsch interrogation record of SS officer Harry Mengeshausen contains his detailed description of the incineration and burial of the bodies of Hitler and Braun. On a photograph of the site, Mengeshausen marked a single X where he watched the bodies burned. Two X's mark the burial site. Three X's show the emergency exit of the bunker. His story fit the evidence, but did not provide any proof. The bodies thought to be Hitler and Eva Braun were brought in boxes to the Smear section of the Third Army in the Berlin suburb of Buch and were placed in a kind of barn or cellar. It was underground. There was a terrible stench because it was May and the bodies began to decompose. So their bodies were taken to our field hospital in Buch for identification. Buch became part of Soviet-occupied East Berlin and today remains virtually unchanged. This is the very table on which the suspected remains of Hitler and Braun were examined by a team of Soviet medical pathologists in 1945. They were officially known as the Autopsy Commission. Major Vasily Orlovsky recalled their preliminary findings. They had evidence of witnesses interrogated at headquarters by our Smersh people. And then forensic medical examination revealed the presence of one and the same poison in the stomachs of the dogs as well as in the stomachs of Brown and Hitler. It was potassium cyanide. Dental evidence became the vital clue in identifying the otherwise severely burned corpses. Hitler's teeth had required frequent attention. His personal dentist had fled Berlin, but the dental assistant was rounded up and told to draw detailed sketches of both Hitler's and Braun's teeth. Her drawings matched the teeth from the corpses almost perfectly and provided for the autopsy commission the most compelling evidence that they in fact had the bodies of Hitler and Eva Braun. This is the official Soviet file on the autopsy of Adolf Hitler. It reported that the male corpse was between 50 and 60 years old and severely disfigured by fire. That glass splinters, presumably from a cyanide capsule, were found in the mouth. That the corpse possessed only one testicle. The report also stated that part of the cranium was missing, yet concluded that death was caused by poisoning with cyanide compounds. For Stalin, the cautious and contradictory findings only fueled his worries that the medical experts had been fooled by some elaborate conspiracy. Alleged Hitler sightings were being reported. So at the Potsdam conference in 1945, Stalin accused the Allies of helping Hitler escape, of harboring the Fuhrer in British-occupied Germany. Cold War propaganda was born. As far as I know, Stalin was interested in what was to be done with the bodies. Then a command came, as I remember, from above to burn the bodies and scatter the ashes. Was that order ever carried out? Official Soviet history says that Hitler's body was cremated. No, nobody cremated the body. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. Why are you so certain? What do you mean, why? because we did not burn any bodies. In 1945, you could hardly find a working crematorium. Couldn't you have made a fire? No, you cannot burn bones in a fire. 
What makes you so sure of that? Because you need a very high temperature for it. A fire cannot get hot enough. Finally, an historic admission that the man who set Europe on fire was indeed not consumed by Soviet flames. This is the very first time that we were able to crack them. You know, it took a long, long time to get them so far that they really want to tell us what really happened there. They're certainly telling us the truth. Even though both of them have been trained for many years in keeping silent on this subject and in fact swore they would never reveal it to anybody. Also, they pointed out several times that the history books were wrong and that all those Russians had been lying to each other on what happened in 45. For years, rumors persisted that Adolf Hitler escaped the bunker alive. There were stories that he fled by plane to Argentina, that he took a submarine to Antarctica. He was spotted as a waiter in Bavaria and was only recently reported to have died of a heart attack at the age of 103. All that was fantasy and myth. In early June 1945, all the bodies, including the boxes with the remains of Hitler and Eva Braun, the Goebbels family and General Krebs were buried somewhere in the vicinity of Buch. When our Smirsch section moved, we took the bodies with us. As the areas of post-war occupation were negotiated, the Smirsch unit moved from town to town, repeatedly burying and exhuming the bodies. It is a macabre and unknown piece of history that former Smirsch officer Vasily Orlovsky reluctantly brought to light. Tell us, please, how many times they were buried? Several times. Uh, how many? Five, eight, ten times? No, I, I know they were buried at least twice. Were the reburials always at night? Yes, yes, night. And it happened three times? Yes, as far as I remember, it was three times. You buried them? dug them up, reburied them, dug them up again. Is that what you did? Yeah. Are you telling this story for the first time in your life? I've never told anyone about this until now. No one, that's the truth. It's the first time I've ever talked about this. More revelations would come from another old Smirsch man who had dutifully kept his secrets since 1945. He was Ivan Tereshenko. And together with Ivan Blaschuk, he agreed to return to Germany and relive events of his time there. The first stop was a woods near the cities of Rathenau and Stendhal, an area they remembered as a secret Smirsch burial site. They were very, very reluctant to participate in the story. And also, we used a little ploy in order to get that, let's say, knowledge out of them. We took a Russian crew and they believed that they were talking to Russian television and not to a Western European team. Here in these woods, I don't know the exact spot, and I'm not sure if anybody does. Since this place was never mapped, and no markings were ever made on the ground, were buried the remains of Hitler and Eva Braun, Goebbels with Magda, his wife, their six children, and General Krebs. Exactly where they were all buried, I don't know. Then Tereshenko unexpectedly revealed the unknown historical fact of a second Hitler autopsy. Here they reopened the graves and the second autopsy took place. After it was finished, the remains were buried again in the same grave. Whose doubts initiated the second examination? I think that the doubts could only have come from the center, from Moscow. I believe it was an order from Stalin to establish whether it was really Hitler or one of his doubles. Stalin's mind was still not at rest. Hitler had duped him before and deep suspicions lingered that Hitler might still be alive somewhere and working on a comeback. The second autopsy, however, confirmed the results of the first. Meanwhile, the Smirsch unit was still in possession of Hitler's corpse, and its bizarre journey did not end in the woods of Soviet-occupied Germany. 
Along with the remains of Eva Braun and the entire Goebbels family, it had traveled from Berlin to Rathenau and Stendal, and then seven months later to the city of Magdeburg. There, the bodies of Hitler and all the others were buried once again. Smirsch had transformed an entire street into a private compound and permanent headquarters. This building wasn't here then. And this one is new. Wasn't this the officers' club? This was the officers' club. Yes. This, this was Here's it. the fence. Blaschuk and Pereshenko had lived and worked in this Smirsch enclave for more than five years following the end of the war. Neither had ever imagined that one day they would return. The two had lost touch with each other after their time in Germany. But now they were men in a time warp, transported back nearly 50 years, curious and fascinated with everything they saw. A former Smirsch security chief, Ivan Blaschuk, was usually careful to distance himself from personal involvement in the events he described. Tereshenko's presence always seemed to make him more comfortable, to loosen his instinctive defenses. Yet, it still came as a surprise when he suddenly led the way to the site where he had personally supervised the burial of Goebbels and his family. This, he said, was the final resting place of Joseph Goebbels, his wife and their six children. We were told that they were reburying uh, uh, Goebbels, his wife and children, and General Krebs, and that an order had been issued to bury them and level the graves and to erase all signs of the burial site. We were told to keep it secret. I personally did not take part, but I saw it and I know it happened at night. Ivan Tereshenko now described how Hitler and Eva Braun were buried in a separate site. Their remains were placed into the inspection pit of a garage, then covered with dirt and asphalt. In Moscow, Tereshenko and Blaschuk had independently sketched maps of the Smirsch compound from memory. The burial sites were also marked and corresponded almost perfectly. The rumors about Hitler escaping in a plane above the Brandenburg Gate made us laugh. We used to say, there he is, in the garage. Tereshenko then led the way to the site where Hitler was buried. Up to here was the site of the garage. Here was the garage. It was quite a different place then. So it was here. This was it. What's so funny? Nothing's funny. This is the place. Here lies the object you're interested in. What object? Hitler and Eva. Do I have to drag the information from you? No, you, you don't have to. Here lie the remains of Hitler and Eva Braun. Could this cluster of garbage cans mark the final grave of Adolf Hitler? The vainglorious, self-styled leader of the Nazi master race? Several months after Tereshenko and Blaschuk made their startling revelations, sensitive detection equipment was brought to the Magdeburg site. The technology is known as ground-penetrating radar. The radar was used first to probe the Goebbels burial site. Okay, Electronic energy is pulsed into the ground and then reflected back into the red antenna box. Mark. 
the data is computer processed and then displayed as a digital color image. The entire area which Blaschuk had identified as the Goebbels burial site was carefully scanned. Can't do any better than that, guys. In the precise spot which Ivan Blaschuk had pointed out, the ground penetrating radar showed a large and significant underground disturbance or anomaly. It's the only change that occurs in this whole back garden. Yeah. So it's a relatively strong anomaly that's produced by something other than what's normal to this particular area. What the anomaly is, the radar cannot identify. Yet the findings were completely consistent with Ivan Blaschuk's memory of where he buried the bodies of Joseph Goebbels and his family. A hundred meters across the former Smirsch compound lay the other burial spot. This is the area where Ivan Tereshenko said that two wooden ammunition crates containing the remains of Adolf Hitler and Eva Braun were placed into the inspection pit of a garage and then covered over. The ground penetrating radar was used again to carefully scan a large part of the site. Once again, the radar found something. We have two anomalies. Both of these anomalies seem to be located before this metal target and in this general vicinity from, say, from here to here. They don't continue as we move further away. I can't go in that direction, obviously, because of the obstructions. Very, very interesting. The distance between them would seem to be about one meter. The radar findings were eerily consistent with Ivan Tereshenko's story. Could it indeed be the final resting place of Adolf Hitler and Eva Braun? For many people, it might be important to know the truth of what happened in 45 and what happened during the world war you know you have to you have to understand that for most europeans the second world war is not over yet there's still a lot of pain and a lot of mental suffering here people are still very very interested to see what really happened and that it's all over by now and maybe the finding of those bodies clear, cold winter morning in 1993, the suspected Hitler burial site was unceremoniously opened. Once the surface layer of concrete and asphalt was broken, larger equipment would perform the preliminary excavation. Smirsch and then the Red Army had occupied these grounds until 1970. Then it became the domain of the East German city of Magdeburg. Not until the fall of the Berlin Wall and the reunification of Germany would an exploration like this one even have been imaginable. It took barely half an hour to reach what verged on the depth of a grave. Now the earth was carefully peeled away less than an inch at a time. A piece of bone is discovered. Hand shovels now replace the heavy equipment as the search inch deeper. After a few minutes, shreds of rotted wood were found. More careful digging gradually revealed the old pre-war block walls of what well could have been an inspection pit for cars. The clues were intriguing, 
But after hours of thorough searching, no other remains were found. The single uncovered bone was determined not to be human. With daylight quickly vanishing, attention was turned to the site where Joseph Goebbels, his wife and six children were remembered to have been buried. This was the spot that Blaschuk had identified and where ground penetrating radar had found the anomaly in the area. As the excavation progressed, no signs or clues appeared. The chain of witnesses and evidence was leading to another dead end. Since the radar detects disturbances of the soil as readily as objects, it may be that what the radar saw were graves that had been emptied of the contents they once held. Or perhaps the excavations were simply in the wrong locations. Well, we're talking about events that happened, what, nearly 50 years ago. And uh, during that time, quite clearly, a lot has happened. Uh, the sites have been uh, reused for other purposes. Most of the houses in the street have, in fact, been demolished. There are a lot of un inaccessible places on this site, places we simply cannot dig. Uh, we do not have a mandate to destroy the buildings that are existing here, so we simply cannot proceed at this stage. The search now led back to Moscow where the special archive at the KGB was long rumored to be in possession of Adolf Hitler's remains. Anatoly Prokopenko is Russia's deputy minister of archives. Early in the spring of 1992, one of the Moscow archive directors said to me, what do you think we shall do with Hitler's remains, which we have been keeping for several decades now? I said, oh, so it is true that they are there. Then I must have a look at them and then make some decision. I went to that archive and then, in a business-like manner, they brought in something that was wrapped in craft paper and put it on the table. Inside there was a box resembling a hat box or shoe box. In the box, there were three skull fragments. The existence of the skull parts had been a state secret, but recently, after prolonged discussions and negotiations, exclusive permission was given to film them for the first time. They had been stored for decades under lock and key, wrapped in a bundle of tattered paper. of the skull of Adolf Hitler, complete with bullet hole. In the second package, several smaller fragments. If the Russian claims of authenticity are true, how and why did parts of Hitler's skull find their way to Moscow? According to Russian authorities, the answers are contained in eight volumes of secret files that accompany the skull parts. Sergei Miranyenko is director of the Central State Archive of the Russian Federation. For reasons unknown to me, it was decided to remove these documents from the special archives of the KGB and send them to our archive. Why this was done, I do not know. These documents came here and were uh, not even registered. Obviously. This was done to hide these documents so there would not be even a trace left. 
According to Mirinenko, the files reveal yet another investigation into the death of Adolf Hitler. It was begun nearly a year after the Soviets took the bunker and conducted by Stalin's secret police chief, the feared and hated Lavrenti Beria. Beria inspected the Führer bunker and reanalyzed all the evidence of Hitler's suicide. He ordered that Hitler's first shallow grave be excavated again and as a result discovered two partially burned skull bones, one of which had an exit bullet wound. Beria took the bones with him, probably to deliver them personally to Joseph Stalin in Moscow. The skull bones provided more evidence of Hitler's suicide. The bullet hole suggested that Hitler shot himself through the mouth, and the pieces altogether seem to account for the missing parts of the cranium mentioned in the first Soviet autopsy. This photograph from the archive file shows the fragments reassembled into one piece as a graphic presentation for the benefit of Stalin. These blood-stained scraps of wood and fabric, hidden along with the skull parts, were part of the bunker sofa on which Hitler and Eva Braun were said by some to have taken their lives in the bleak final days of the war. Photographs of the sofa itself accompany the evidence. More reassurance for Stalin that Hitler was really dead. These are memoirs of one of the passive participants of this investigation, Hitler's valet, his name was Linger. He complains that there was a lot of beating during his questioning, terrible beating, there was much blood. And uh, one of the commissars was saying, why are you surprised? We had good Gestapo teachers. Of course, it's hard to say who taught whom. One of the archive files contains a sketch map of the Führer bunker, drawn by Linge while in Soviet hands. Linge was one of a number of Hitler's bunker entourage taken prisoner by Smirsch and repeatedly interrogated for years. There's an interesting detail, and you are the first to know it. I've never told it to anyone. Hitler's chief pilot in his evidence says that Eva Braun was pregnant at the time of her suicide. Fragments of new evidence and tantalizing rumors. Yet the whole picture was not complete. The full answer to what happened to Adolf Hitler was still being hidden by the Russians. By 1946, Hitler, Goebbels, and the children were, uh, of course, buried. Uh, what happened to them uh, later is a question. But it's not a question to be asked of this archive. Perhaps it is behind the Kremlin walls or somewhere in the deep recesses of the former KGB that the answer to Hitler's final fate now resides. Wherever the truth now lies, Russian authorities have chosen not to divulge it. After nearly half a century, the Kremlin's doors remain closed to the ever-sensitive subject of Adolf Hitler. There are many secrets, still many secrets in Russia. We didn't find the bodies, but what we did find was a correction on what was written in 1945. There it started. Everyone who was telling about what happened in 1945, what the Russians had done then, uh, proved not to be correct. And it has been admitted by the Russians. So from a journalistic point of view, our story has been proven. We had made a correction on history by saying that the bodies of those top Nazis found in 1945 in Berlin were not burned, their ashes were not thrown into the wind, as everyone wrote, but that they were buried several times, and that they finally ended up in Magdeburg. It matters because history ought to be correct. We owe it to ourselves to know what really happened, and there have been a lot of fairy stories after the war, uh, generated mostly uh, by Stalin's refusal to divulge the truth, or maybe Stalin's refusal to believe the truth himself. Now is the time, because we've come up with so much new evidence about what really happened, now is the time to tell the story properly. Next Sunday in True Stories, we follow each scientific step needed to turn Steven Spielberg's Jurassic Park into a reality. 
Can genetic engineers really reconstruct living, breathing dinosaurs? Find out in The Real Jurassic Park, an exciting premiere next Sunday night at 8.30. Shortly, our drama, You, Me and It. Good, honest journalism. That's...